So entrepreneurs in the house, one of the problems which has been searching for a product market fit has been getting conferences started on time with the projectors. So anybody who solves that is definitely going to have a very, very good product market fit. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for uh, coming to this talk. Yeah. We'll be so when I was preparing for um, this talk, Ayush, who is coordinating on Gojek's behalf, and who ha who was with, until very recently with your story, uh, was the first person I contacted on what is something that I can speak about, which would be useful to uh, the people who attend your story events, yeah. and he recommended that I talk about product market fit because it's a topic which generally has not been spoken about much in the previous uh, sessions as well. Okay? And although we talk about dreaming big, having a good team, getting success, but there's no theoretical frameworks or uh, mechanism through which entrepreneurs or early employees can go back and analyze and see whether they are actually on the path towards a product market fit or not. So this is the technology adoption life cycle. I'm sure everyone has seen it. Okay? Any uh, topic around growth, chasm, uh, market fits, technology adoption is not complete till this one is shown. Okay? Now usually what we talk about is the cycle from there, right? And we have topics like growth, growth hacking, growth engineering, paid advertisements, etc., which help us navigate the growth cycle. Okay? Some people also talk about the chasm. So if you would see between the first two curves and the final three curves, there is a, a gap, which is called the chasm. Okay? So before you can go on to the growth cycle, okay, you have to cross that chasm. And that chasm can take sometimes a week, sometimes months, sometimes years for organizations to cross. Okay? There are frameworks, again, available to analyze the chasm and how to bridge the chasm. The most famous of which is from uh, Jeffrey Moore, who's actually written a book on it, Crossing the Chasm. It's a very simple, small book. Okay? So if you haven't read it, please pick that up so you don't need to attend uh, another talk on that topic. Okay? The first two, however, which is really the basis, okay? So unless you take, unless we crack these two, okay, we don't get to be in a situation where we are talking about a chasm, okay? And we are also not in a position where we are talking about growth hacking, okay? So how do we crack the first two is what the focus of this particular talk will be, okay? Now, in general, the first question which, when I put together this talk, people asked is, okay, how do I know that I am at that stage? Okay. So the simple answer to that is, if you have to ask that question, you're likely at that stage. Okay. So if you have to, if your questions are not around how I can scale my uh, acquisitions, if your questions are not around how do I ensure that I can get more people exposed to what I have, Okay, then likely your questions are around the product market fit. Okay, so uh, second, it doesn't necessarily mean that you just need to be a few weeks old or a few months old or a few years old. There are organizations which have been in need of a product market fit for years and years and years, and they've actually found one after several years uh, as well. Okay, so there is hope that even if we have taken longer, okay, so success may be uh, sometimes soon. Uh, far closer than we envisage. Okay? So in this talk, we will give you some of the tips to talk about that. Okay? If what I have spoken so far is interesting for you, you can hang around for the next 40 odd minutes. Okay? It's where we will talk a little bit more in detail about the mechanisms. Okay? So we'll talk about what is product market fit. Okay? Because again, a lot of people use that term, but they don't really necessarily know what it is. So that when you're meeting, uh, professionals, when you're meeting consultants, when you're meeting investors, and this is a topic which comes up, you know what exactly is being covered. Okay? Second, we will cover some strategies on how to get product market fit, okay? and especially relevant for people who are in early stages of their startup development. Okay? And we'll talk about startup stories. Who doesn't like that? Okay? So who 
is talking all this? Well, it's me who is Vikrama Lehman. Okay, you can call me Vic. Uh, I am the head of products for Gojek, okay, for transport products. So transport products help transfer you or uh, anything that you own from a point A to point B. Okay, so things like ride hailing, micro mobility, bike sharing, uh, shuttle bus services, etc., are all that uh, is uh, something that I and my team uh, work on. Okay, and I have 16 years of uh, experience uh, working in uh, U.S., Germany, and uh, in India. Bunch of uh, startups and established organizations: uh, Cisco, Airtel, Hike Messenger, DirectEye, uh, Make My Trip and most recently at uh, Gojek, okay? And along with my professional competency, I've also had uh, the uh, opportunity to help my brother uh, build up his business as well. And I ran my own consulting for 10 years as well, okay? So I have some exposure to defining a product market fit and scaling it, okay? And apart from that, I've also, in my uh, professional associations, worked with companies who were who were just literally in their first year of existence. So we had questions around product market fit and we found them like Zeta. Okay? And then there were others which for several years continued to be in search of a product market fit like WizIQ and never really found it. Okay? And, well, WizIQ, nobody knows about it. That just tells you that we didn't find the product market fit. Okay? Then there were others who were sort of small startups within large organizations okay? like launching Gojek in Singapore. Okay. So it is uh, where you are already relevant in Indonesia, but Singapore is as different a market from Indonesia as you can imagine. Developed, high market size, not bike sharing, not uh, going to be two-wheelers. Okay. So how do you launch in that market, especially with a lot of uh, international scrutiny on you? Okay. That also gives uh, some of the spectrum to that. And along with that, I've also been researching on this particular topic for a long time as well. So have read on this topic as well. Okay. So you're in good hands. So first, the only pitch I will do about Gojek in this session is this. After that, no more examples about Gojek. Okay. Gojek literally does everything that you can imagine. Okay. So you need almost 10, 12 apps in India uh, to do different things, but you only need one app in Indonesia, okay. one app in Vietnam, one app in Thailand, and hopefully one app very soon in Singapore, Malaysia, and Philippines as well. And to the question, are we launching in India soon? No, we are not. Okay. So we also have a small, so if you are a team, okay, who wants to initiate discussions on uh, acqui hires and operate as a startup within uh, Gojek on what you're doing around any of these verticals, please feel free to reach out to us. We also have a Go Ventures uh, division, okay, which invests in startups, including the ones in uh, India as well. I think we have invested in uh, MPP uh, amongst uh, other uh, startups recently. And if you are a startup which has strong uh, synergies with uh, food delivery, ride hailing, or payments, okay, and uh, you would like to uh, talk about it, uh, you can catch me or you can catch one of my colleagues, Chirag, and we can put you in touch with the right people. This talk has also been put together in association with a lot of my uh, friends and advisors uh, from the startup community. One of them is here, Piyush from Reuters. Okay. So uh, they've contributed to the uh, reviewing the slides, to validating some of the things that we had uh, put together as well. Okay. So I've tried to get my product market fit for this before. So the first lesson of product market fit that I thought was the most enlightening one for me, was to read it the other way around as market product fit. Okay? So don't start with your product first, start with your market first. Okay? And why is that particular thing important? Okay? The next two quotes will probably resonate a lot more than any of the statistics that can be presented on that particular topic. Okay? So when a great team meets a lousy market, market wins. When a lousy team meets a great market, market wins. When a great team meets a great market, something special happens. Okay. In a terrible market, you can have the best product in the world 
and an absolute killer team, and it doesn't matter, you're going to fail. Okay. So that's the importance of the market. Okay. And in several cases, when you will meet certain founders, okay, and I hear this so many times from certain founders who are struggling, that they come back and say, you know what, we have a, such a killer team, I have such a, I have a much better team than this ABC other startup which is really riding wave on something. Okay? The reason why th invariably they are riding the wave, they are riding the market wave and not the product wave. Okay? So therefore, getting the market right first is the most important thing. We don't really know whether we've gotten the market right without building the product. Okay? So we need to get the product out first. Okay? Then only we know, okay, have we gotten the market right or not. Okay? So one of the ways in which you can see is whether our company's value proposition, that is something that we are positioning to our customers, okay, our customers and their needs, as well as our distribution channels to reach those customers have a fitment or not. Okay. If there is a dissonance between them, we're likely not in a product market fit. Okay. Now this is a very heavy duty worded uh, sentence. Okay. How do we crack it? Okay. Well, again, quite simply, okay, if customers are buying your product just as fast as you can make it, okay, or usage is growing just as fast as you can add servers, okay, then you likely have a product market fit. Okay? Now, how many of you watched Silicon Valley? Yeah? So you must have remembered this one scene when uh, somebody who went to rescue a bird from a top of the tunnel got stuck, right? And what, and what ends up happening is one Filipino influencer ends up tweeting about it, and suddenly there's a huge traffic on the live streaming, okay? and the servers are going bonkers. Okay? So if you are figuring out only technology problems to cope up with the growth, okay? not technology problems which you want to solve, technology problems to cope up with the growth which your customers are asking for, you likely are in a product market fit situation. So some of the signs that you can look for, well, the first sign is retention. That's one of the things which I've found was a mistake that I made when I looked at WizIQ in 2008. Okay? We focused a lot more on customer acquisition. Okay, we focused a lot less on retention. Okay? We were always saying things like thousands of customers signing up every day. We've now reached one million customers. We've now reached two million customers. Okay? Well, the more important number was how many of those customers are retaining on day one? How many of them are retaining day 30? How many of them are retaining day 60? Okay? Then one of the signs of retention also ends up in referrals. Okay? How many of the other customers are being pulled by the customers that you have reached in your early stage startup? Okay? So if we have gotten these two things correct, then getting the product market fit is far, far easier. Along with that, we also need a validation of our business model. Okay? So the validation of our business model generally happens on how does our acquisition costs and lifetime value of the looks like. Okay? In generally, the customer acquisition costs for an early stage startup are going to be very, very high. Okay? If you are a B2B startup, you will end up spending a lot of your time meeting uh, clients, you will end up a lot of time traveling, okay? so therefore that's the cost of your time. Okay? If you are a B2C startup, you will be spending a lot more on paid advertisement so that you can get noticed. Okay? So you don't have control over acquisition costs. What you have control though is on the lifetime value. So if your acquisition costs are high, what is also important is that the lifetime value of your early customers has to be significantly higher than the ones that you will get at a later stage as well. Okay? So therefore, in your early product market fit, what we are looking for is customers who have the highest lifetime value. Okay? So example of lifetime values that we can look at, if you are a B2C startup, okay? so then, Usage, so in seven days, how many times do customers use you? Okay. So how much is average session? Okay. Are they just using you for two minutes or are they using you for 30 minutes? 
okay? Now, again, these numbers themselves don't really mean a lot, okay? So they can also be times when they, un they can be also products where customers only necessarily need to use you for two minutes, so exercise your discretion over that, but don't console yourself saying that, okay, uh, customers are, are using some other product also for two minutes and they're using us also for two minutes when actually your usage needs to be far higher than that, okay? Organic growth, okay, hundreds of free signups happening likely as a referral from other customers, okay? That's uh, something which will be important, okay? 30% of the users are active day one, okay? Now this number again, dependent, these numbers you should adjust basis your acquisition cost. If you're going to spend $50 acquiring the customers, okay, multiply each of these numbers significantly. Users probably need to be active all seven days. Your day one retention number should be around 70 to 80%, okay? And your Dow Mao ratio is greater than 30%. Okay. If you are, if you have designed a B2C product which is also around pricing, where uh, customers need to pay, then X percent of those customers are also paying becomes important as well. Okay. If you are a B2B startup, okay, your free to paid conversion needs to be at least 10 percent. If it is not 10 percent, or is it any less than that, then likely we have not gotten the customers right. If we have not gotten the customers right or their needs right, if we've Either case, we've not gotten the market right, okay? Again, cost per acquisition and LTV should be 3X at least. Again, depending on how expensive it is to acquire the customers, the lifetime value should also go up, okay? And hopefully zero monthly churn, okay? So because you're going to be lightly banking on around only 50, 60 customers to make an assumption on whether you have product market fit, even if you have one or two cases of churn, okay, you need to dig deeper and see wh what caused that. Churn. Now, let's go back to the thing we started with, okay? So essentially, what we are looking at is that how do we frame questions in our mind, okay, so that we can go back in our teams and address those questions right hand, okay? So the questions that we are looking at is how do we get retention, how do we get referrals, okay, and how do we get aha moments from enough of our customers up front, okay? So in the case of a B2C startup, you are looking at getting somewhere around 100,000 such customers. Okay? And in the case of a B2B startup, depending on whether you have a large client like Accenture or you have a bunch of smaller clients, those numbers may vary from 10 to 100. Okay? So for those customers, are we able to get those aha moments, are we able to pull referrals, are we able to retain them significantly? Once we have been able to do them, then we can go on our hockey stick journey and get more customers in, knowing that the rest of the funnel, even if the efficiency falls a bit, okay, the mathematics will take care of itself. Okay? And in the talk which Rajan Anandan said, if we get to this particular stage, he will be probably one of the investors talking to you. <coughs> Reminder again, if you have to ask if you have product market fit, we likely don't have. Okay? So let's go back to the basics and see that are we talking retention? Are we talking uh, referrals? Are we talking lifetime value of our customers? Are we talking aha moments of our customers? Or are we talking acquisitions? And how many more customers can we acquire and expose? So let's now go into a little bit of mechanics, which will be a quick primer based on the, some of the academic research and some of the uh, pub material which has been published by luminaries like Andrew Chen, Mark Anderson, Ash Maria, uh, et cetera. So essentially, your product market fit is a fitment between two aspects. So we have a target customer, okay, which is at the one end, and then we have feature set and UX, which is at the other end. Okay. Now your feature set and UX essentially doesn't talk to the target customers directly. Okay. What ends up talking is the need of the customer with the value proposition that you are giving. And classic example of that is like, let's, which is the story of TikTok in India. Okay. For all practical purposes, the need for such a product, product did not exist because Instagram, YouTube, several other products served exactly the same features. Okay. Videos that anybody can shoot, upload, and you can broadcast it to a network. Instagram has been doing it for how many years? Like donkey's years. Okay. But what is not identified and what is not met is the undeserved need. Okay. So 
In one of the cases, somebody described TikTok is actually Instagram for Bhojpuri or Bengali or Assamese. Okay. And that's a way of describing your value proposition. Okay. That also then identifies who's the customer whose needs are being solved. Okay. And therefore, what ends up talking to the customers is your value proposition. What they are fitting it against is their needs. Okay. So therefore, a lot of startups also make this mistake of seeing that whether this feature makes sense or not. Okay. The features in the B2C world, in the B2B world, there's a finite list of features which everyone borrows from. And the longer you are around, every startup in features looks at doing exactly the same things. Okay. So I have done almost seven, eight products myself, seven, eight different companies. I have the same technical challenges, same feature challenges, same UX discussions in every single company I go and join. Okay. What is different is the value proposition and the messaging and the pitch and the targeting of the customers that we have. So initially, when we are at an early stage, and even later, the essential approach is to identify underserved needs. Okay. Now, this has been another uh, thing which I have uh, learned while I was preparing this particular talk, okay, that we always talk about needs, we always talk about problems, but we don't have a framework of framing what needs are we looking for. Okay. So customers have so many different needs, but which needs are we looking at? Okay. So we are looking at underserved needs. Okay. There is a, we will be talking about a framework on how to identify uh, underserved needs as well. Okay. Second thing that we are looking for is early traction. And early traction that we are looking for is in the bottom half of the funnel, which is on retention, referral, and lifetime value. Okay. The means to get the balance between three and one is second, which is building solutions. Okay. And how rapidly can we build solutions to iterate and test this particular thing? In some cases, if we are lucky, okay, our first attempt may stick. Okay. Like, for instance, when uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen were working on their product, which was basic, they actually just put it and ported it on their uh, first personal computer, very, very rudimentary personal computer, which was available, Altair, which was being manufactured in Albuquerque. Literally only a few thousands of them were being sold. Okay. But since they were not competing with IBM for that, they were competing with other people in garage building it. Okay. So therefore, just being the first ones to get to that ensures that you have a solid product market fit. Okay. Similarly, in the case of Hewlett and Packard, they literally had just one client, Walt Disney. Okay. But it was a big client and they had a very big need and that propelled the need for an audio oscillator which built Hewlett Packard to where it is. So you must have seen the canvas. Okay. So this canvas, if you will go and search Ash Moria version of canvas or just look at the lean canvas, some of the things have been changed, okay, which are more relevant for early stage startups. The canvas overall makes sense for a company which is at the growth stage, slightly at an advanced stage. Okay. This one is slightly uh, shorter. Okay. So the things we are looking for is unfair advantage. Okay, and we'll talk about some of the examples of unfair advantage in just a bit later. Okay. Again, starts from your customer segments. Who are the customers that we are serving? Okay. It's incredible that of how many people okay, we talk to, uh, our Go Ventures team uh, continuously gives us feedback, of how many entrepreneurs that we speak to who are not able to clearly articulate on what customers and of those customers what need is being solved quite crisply. Okay. And there's no validation of the customer or the validation of the need of those uh, particular customers. Okay. So this is a very, very simple uh, canvas which helps uh, fix that uh, for us. Okay. So from customer segments, we need to identify the value proposition, the solution we are offering, the problem that we are doing, and the channels we are going to use to reach those particular customers. Okay. So if we are reaching a, a B2B client like Accenture, Okay. How do we reach them is very different. Okay. So this uh, festival season when the big billion sales happen, okay, for a lot of uh, social media marketing, both Amazon and Flipkart ended up using TikTok. And based on some of the early 
uh, trends and research which has come up, Flipkart's actually done better on targeting on TikTok, which has meant they've actually done far better sales in tier two and tier three uh, towns as well. Okay, So where the channels that you use, again, depend on where your customers are and what channels are useful at reaching them. Also, these are bonus, okay? So key metrics, revenue streams, and cost structures, okay? These may not be as important for you to focus on if you are not looking at raising a round of funding immediately, okay? So these are more important only when we have to go externally, okay? So some, uh, so therefore, if we need to prioritize, the ones in blue are more important, okay? So first, we have to get them, then we go to number two. Number two, the red ones are a validation. They put them in a business model perspective and helps you validate it from a logical perspective on whether you're getting the blue parts right or not. Okay? So if you will see, blue is more right-brained, more soft, more creative, while the ones in red is a little more logical and left-brained. And finally, focus on unfair advantages. Okay? So some of the unfair advantages are you are the first mover. Okay, you have now accumulated insights which are uh, better than anything which your competition or somebody who's going to start off now uh, would have. Okay, or you have now accumulated customer data which uh, somebody who is going to start off next will uh, no longer be able to do that. Patents is another uh, unfair uh, advantage. Okay, clocking some of the marquee customers in the process uh, is uh, an unfair advantage like Hewlett Packard had with uh, uh, Walt Disney. Okay? So then once you have Walt Disney, all the other movie studios are going to follow suit because you are the only one who can cite a reference in that particular market. Okay? So I'm not going to go a little more deeper into unfair advantages, but if you just do a search on Google on unfair advantages, Ash Moria has a very, very good blog on this topic. Finally, how can a talk on product market fit be complete without talking about minimum viable product? Okay. So one of the most abused terms in the industry right now, everybody uses it to literally mean minimum product, okay, not minimum viable product. Okay. But the viable part in minimum viable product is also very important. Okay. So first, if you have to focus on in minimum viable product, focus on the viable product part of it. Okay, then focus on the minimum aspects of it. And one of, the re one of the ways in which we can focus on minimum viable product is what has been shown on the right-hand side of this particular thing. Okay? So A, viable is determined by your customers. Okay? So when we were doing Zeta, okay, we had to, we now, Zeta now serves benefits across things. Okay, you can do gadget purchase, you can do medical, you can do travel allowance, you can do meal, you can do different kind of food, you can have your merchants, you can swipe a card, all that jazz. Okay, you also have a fancy expense management system, access control, rules, different kind of customers in an enterprise and all that. But this is now, three years after being in the market. Okay, when we first went to market, we literally had just one engineer working on that product. Okay? And we only built a very rudimentary version of meal vouchers. Okay? The unfair advantage over there was that we allowed people to scan a bill and against that your credits could be, meal credits that you've gotten from your company could be used as well. Therefore, you suddenly were a lot better than Sodexo because Sodexo had only X markets where you could use it and invariably when you would go to a market and ask whether you use Sodexo or not, they'll say no. Here you just suddenly opened up the entire market. Okay. With just that simple thing, we got there. It took nine months to identify that simple thing though. Okay. So therefore, adaptation was important, but then that is what the minimum viable product is, that one end-to-end -end -end vertical slice that we can focus on. Your first minimum viable product may not work. Okay? It may not address the customer or the market needs as well. We may have to do multiple iterations of the minimum viable product uh, as well. Okay? And hence, if we are getting feedback that your product lacks this, your product lacks this, generally the exercise of beefing up the product to make it more viable is a losing one. Okay? Restarting, resketching the whole experience and seeing what is it that we missed in articulating in our value proposition to our customers is the more important exercise. Okay? So once you've done your minimum viable product and you've gone to your customers and you're co collecting some qualitative feedback, at least 40% of customers should say that they would be very disappointed if they're not able to use your product. Going back to the list of metrics, the most important ones are do users come back do users 
tell others, okay? And the acquisition part that we want to be worried about is that when users are asking your customers about something that you have a value proposition on, are your customers recommending you? That's the only acquisition thing that we are worried about. So if you've signed on a company B, okay, and a company C goes and asks the HR manager of company B, hey, I'm looking at a product something like this, will company B recommend you to company C? Okay, that's the acquisition which we're talking about over here. Yes, so NPS is a um, more methodical uh, survey, okay, which makes, like all things which are averages and statistics, makes sense over a large number base, right? So at a small number base, NPS can also be slightly misleading as well, okay? So have an obsession with cohorts. Okay, literally go over every single customer you have acquired, okay, and see what is happening day one, day two, day three, day four. The customer you acquired on day four, what is happening to them on day five? Customer you acquired on day seven, what is happening to them on day 10? Identify outliers. That helps you go back and see which channel worked, which pitch worked, which experiment you did work, which client meeting worked, which sales person's sales pitch, et cetera, worked. All that is very, very important, okay? So does this thing work, okay? So this is all theory, okay? It has been put in books. Several books have been written. Courses are run. MBA classes are run. Entrepreneurship classes talk about all these things, okay? Do these things work? Well, some of the research that I did with some of the founders indicates it does, okay? So let's take an example of one of the uh, startups which has bloomed in the recent past is Chayus. Okay, so uh, I was talking to the CTO just as of today morning. Okay, so when Chayos launched with that one store in uh, Galleria in Gurgaon, okay, so their first goal was to identify a product market fit as well. In our conversation, the the CEO didn't talk about product market fit, but everything that he spoke about was product market fit. We focused a lot on the fact that whether our customers have an aha moment the first time they use our, first time they savor our chai, okay? We are charging 50 rupees at that time, the one, the somebody at Tapri is charging four rupees, six rupees. What's the value proposition we are offering to our customers in that 50 rupees chai, okay? And now, the question next comes is, your front staff can fake whether your customers liked it or not. So how do you know that whether you actually, your customers are doing, really liking your chai or not, okay? This is where the innovation came in, okay? And this was enlightening for me as well. What they did from start was asked you for your phone number. You'll get an OTP and you'll get some loyalty points on your, uh, num on your number. You literally would just quote your number. And this is seven, about five, six years back. Okay? And now it's commonplace everywhere, but at that time it wasn't. Okay? And what that would do is 92% of all purchases were tied to a phone number. That gave the early team access to a lot of insights about the customers. Which customers who had purchased what, at what store, at what time, ended up doing what. Okay? With that mining, they were able to figure out a lot of things on what will work for customers, what pitch works, what positioning works, what offer that was going on works, and so on. And that also helped them navigate their loyalty, which helped retention, okay? That, once you have the phone numbers, also helped you pilot a referral program very, very quickly as well. Also test out things, whether you need to also add snacks, et cetera, and so on, increases your lifetime value, okay? Once that is done, tested it across eight, moved from one to two, two to four, four to eight uh, stores across different parts of India, okay? Once it was validated at eight stores, Series A happened, Okay. Somebody like Tiger Global who only invests in tech startups, at that time, Chai was, well, there was some tech there, but largely it was an operations uh, business, invested there as well, and now it's everywhere, and it's actually led the rise of the Chai startups uh, in uh, India. Okay. So that's just one example of obsessing over the product market fit. Obviously, in two minutes, it looks a lot simpler when you are undergoing it and when you are seeing, okay, this thing also didn't work, this thing also doesn't work, this thing also doesn't work, this thing also doesn't work. Just soldiering on and trying that next X thing is the only tactical thing that we have in our toolkit. 
And hopefully by now, we have measures and mechanisms and frameworks which we can use to analyze the cycle that we need to be analyzing things on. Okay, so now is the part of the presentation which you will not found, which you will not find in the top 10 pages of Google search on product market fit, okay? So this is the part which you actually came for. And uh, I don't know whether you'll find it on 11th page because I didn't check beyond 10th page, okay? So first recommendation of a book, please pick up a book called Origin and Evolution of New Business. If you don't want to keep the heavy duty title, the name of the author is Amar Bhide. It's a book, uh, late 1980s, but it is perhaps the most methodical research on startups and startup successes ever done over several hundreds of startups. So origin and evolution of new business, okay? Or you can just search the author Amar Bhide, okay? So it's an Indian author, but the guy is based in an Ivy League university, okay? It has a lot of gems. In fact, like it's a book where I have literally ended up highlighting everything and my Goodreads has now truncated my highlights because it's literally the whole book highlighted. Okay. How do the ink companies, about 90% of whom don't offer a unique product or service, okay? so unique product or service, not unique product positioning, okay? grow so profitably and so quickly when most other startups struggle to survive? The unusual profitability to the ink companies, I will suggest, derives to a significant discovery from the hospitable nature of the markets they compete in. I'm sure a lot of you have read Zero to One, okay? If you have, go back and read the parts where Peter Thiel talks about monopoly a lot more, okay? So don't read it because we want to build a monopoly. It's very hard to build a monopoly, okay? And uh, there are uh, social and ethical concerns around uh, monopolies as well as in a world which is going slightly distributed and decentralized on what the structures of monopolies will be in future is still debatable, okay? But it is very useful in understanding certain market structures, okay? So you generally have two kinds of markets which are available for early stage startups to target, okay? One is 75% of the market, Okay. Now, this is very uh, subjective because the way you define the market. Okay. So if I define the market as uh, tier three India, then TikTok probably has a monopoly. But if I define the overall uh, market as India, and if I'm looking at the spending power of people, then TikTok probably is not a monopoly. Okay. So it's generally a winner takes all. Okay. Barriers to entry after you have entered are the most important thing. Okay? So this is things like where you have corporate relationships, where you have device relationships, where you have network effects because others are using you, etc. It makes it harder to penetrate. Okay? And there are deep specific needs of some customers that you can satisfy easily first. Okay? That's where you can aim and get monopolies in. Generally, this is good in theory, but getting a monopoly is very, very incredible hard business. Okay? And over the years, there has, been, uh, re there has been also research done that actually getting monopolies done is becoming far, far, far harder because now with uh, democratization of uh, computational uh, resources, multiple other countries making it uh, possible to do your startups and the barriers to entry for everyone at the same time happening are low, so therefore you can have a lot of fast uh, moving copycats to whatever you are doing, okay? So therefore getting monopolies is very, very, uh, is slightly difficult. Therefore, the other one, which is the Keith Boyce general uh, method is the far better method, which is going after large markets, okay? But markets where you have state of limited competition, okay? So therefore you have only very few known people. Dissatisfaction with incumbents, okay? So people are not happy with the people who are already there, okay? So, and there is vertical integration which is possible. That is, you can offer an end-to-end -end experience, okay? So an end-to-end -end experience would be, for instance, in e-commerce, you also own logistics, you also own delivery, you also own how your uh, sellers are also on your particular platform so that you can offer the user experience end-to-end, -end, okay? 
So this second one is the one which we will dig into a little more. In those, you generally have two kinds of markets. You will have consumption markets or non-consumption markets. Okay? Consumption markets are markets where the demand is tangible and known. Okay? So you can very methodically analyze that. Okay? Incumbents rule the roast. Okay? What you need to crack that is 10x better startups or 10x better performance. In non-consumption markets, the needs don't exist. Okay? So for instance, before Facebook, the need to kill your time when you are bored standing in a queue in a checkout didn't exist. You just had no option but to get bored. Okay? Now you can open up social media and kill your boredom. Okay? So that need did not exist. Okay? The need, uh, similarly, there are other intangible needs which people have that I want to share a photo of me with my friends thrice a day every single day. Okay. That need didn't really exist or existed in very few uh, pieces. Okay. The places to identify such behavior is with what society calls weirdos. Okay. So the weirder the behavior is, the more normal it will be in a few years timeline. Okay. So see what is a toy, see what is uh, the outlier behavior. That's where generally you will find the insights on what the needs need to be. Uh, met. No obvious incumbents because, well, there is no need, so nobody is addressing it. Okay? Incremental adaptation works a lot better over here. Okay? And it also grows the market. And the, another thing which is really useful over here, choosing a non-consumption market, is that your, the question which VCs or somebody else will ask, what will happen if Google uh, joins you or Google enters the industry that you are in? or Amazon enters the industry you are in, will not apply here because it's non-consumption, demand is not uh, tangible, so therefore they're unlikely to join in. It's important that we also, when, especially when we will be pitching to investors, we don't just talk about market overall, we talk about total addressable market. Okay. So if we have a product that directly competes with a product B, and product B has already tied up 90% of enterprise customers on their product, okay, so your addressable market is just 10%. Okay. So one of the ways in which we can uh, define the addressable markets is by either doing value creation, that we'll create value for you, that I'll help you save 10,000 rupees every month, and therefore, I will be able to take 10% of that. So that's 1,000 rupees. So my addressable market is 10% of the saving that I am able to give to X customers in uh, the market. Okay. Then there is macro value generation, which is who are you creating this value for? And is there a reasonable amount of people in the world that have this particular uh, problem that they will pay to solve that particular problem for you? Okay. So for instance, in micro value creation, drivers whom I Gojek can provide riders for, we can keep 10% of that. So that's our addressable market. In macro value, how many customers can I target, okay? And how much can I charge? And can I keep, can I charge customers a service fee? Okay, that comes under the macro uh, value. Number one tip for picking a market is embrace turbulence and uncertainty, okay? So if you have uh, two axes, and your axis one is risk, and the axis two is reward. As your risk generally increases, your reward also will increase. Okay? So where to identify the risk and reward? Going back to the technology adoption life cycle, but addressing these as markets. So this is the market maturity cycle. Okay? So for instance, for cars, et cetera, cars is a declining market uh, share right now. Okay? So so if we will see that the focus that we are looking at, your startups that you are looking at building, the ideal sweet spot is this, okay? So one way to identify something that was hot three years back is still hot, is likely going to get hotter in three years. So identify what markets were hot, have actually still remained hot, which means 
things like regulatory, any recession constraints, any government actions, any market buildup, any industry coverage, any skepticism, any early customer training, et cetera, is being done by people. Okay? And then you do that. Okay? So one of the companies which has done that very, very successfully is Byju's. Okay. So if you will see, a lot of e-learning startups actually started along with Flipkart in 2008, 2007, and so on. They did all your market training in the first curve. Okay. And just as the market was primed to the growth cycle, here, a company which was already actually doing training on the side offline, suddenly embraced online and took the growth uh, phase. Okay. So identifying markets which are at the cusp of growth Okay, is very, very good. Okay. This also offers a lot of interesting options, not only in raising money, because generally money will chase markets. Oh, ride hailing is hot, let's go and invest in ride hailing. Okay. E-commerce is hot, let's go and uh, chase e-commerce. ABC is hot, let's go and chase that. It also helps you get acquired. It also offers you exits in merging with some of the other leaders as well. So right now, some of the things which are important are e-mobility, for instance, is really uh, hot. Uh, some of the other things which are uh, hot are in the enterprise uh, circuits. AI, ML, which has been hot uh, for a while. It is now at the cusp of things uh, meeting as well. So read a little bit more about the market that you're operating on. Bet on when that market is going to suddenly have a growth. See if you can pick a niche in there and orient your product around that. Examples of how uh, in mature markets and growth phase markets, some of the products have been able to do. Okay? So usually your improvement or your pitch is going to be around cost, experience, or positioning. Okay? So positioning will be generally the same, but I am a startup for Bharat. I am the startup for next billion. I am the startup for this. It's literally the same features, okay? but I am this. So cost experience and positioning, so these are the ones who have disrupted and so on. So in certain cases, because you have regulatory, whether you have government constraints, you have bandwidth, you have spectrum costs, etc. not everyone can go and compete, but in several other cases, we can compete. Okay. Second, embrace adaptation. There will be no... We, there will be no banyan tree or uh, bodhi tree available to go and sit under and get enlightenment on what will happen. Okay? We'll, and there will be one of those moments after you've been in the situation. Okay? You can see this. Okay? But it's likely going to be a series of small adjustments that you're doing in adaptation. And again, research, research on several startups which have been done has indicated that 88% of the success of all startups is because of adaptation of the original idea that they had. Some of the examples, okay, I bet some of you don't even know the original names of these startups. Okay, so some of them started off as a location sharing service, but ended up becoming a photo sharing service. I was started off as an e-commerce company, but ended up becoming an engine to launch e-commerce companies. Okay, others ended up launched as a social uh, welfare company, ended up becoming a deals company. Think about a pivot as diverse as that. Looking at underserved markets, so there are two approaches that you can do. One is deep methodical study, which is always useful if you have a base of customers captive for you, likely in B2B startups. If you are addressing crypto, if you are doing things like security, AI, ML, some SaaS solution for your uh, enterprise companies, you can follow this particular method. Don't follow the other one. Okay? If the needs are not well uh, understood, okay, so then we use the fuzzy one. So there you are going to likely have accidental discoveries. So get more people who are like Kunal Shah in your teams. Okay? So they, people who are philosophers, people who are creative, you need more people like that to chance on uh, ex accidental discoveries. Observe more, uh, research more, talk more, delve more, rather than build more. Finally, the timing is the most important thing. We saw one of the curves uh, as well on why timing is a uh, most important thing. Okay? 
a lot of people think that Sequoia invested in Apple and Apple became uh, successful, but Sequoia also invested in Nvidia, Sequoia also invested in chip manufacturers, Sequoia also invested in a whole spectrum of companies which would enable personal computing revolution to happen. Okay? So see what is commonly tying around the market and where are we put positioning our uh, product in that particular positioning. Okay? So some of the things that can help you choose Infrastructure changes, okay, 5G uh, is one of the most important changes which is happening, okay. Tech changes uh, that are happening, uh, distributed, decentralized, okay, business changes that are happening, okay, and customer changes that are happening. So going after monopoly requires you to build network effects, which will invariably mean starting small. So then there are a number of books on network effects, I'm not going to talk a little bit more about it. So once you have network effects, economies of scale become easier. One of the ways in which you can have economies of scale is also having proprietary technology, which is 10x better than your competition. Okay. So here, finding your niche and a self-running engine is very, very important. Okay. So that rest of your growth just pulls itself. Here, we are looking at more around uh, identifying an anomaly that we can take advantage of. So we are looking at adaptation. One final thing, one final thing, which is perhaps the most important thing, so I left it at the end, you. Okay? So one of the reasons why you're not having product market fit is actually you as an entrepreneur. Okay? And this came in from several early employees that I spoke to, that the reason why their last company failed was because the entrepreneur was not responsive and adaptive enough. Okay? So smart people, are very good at rationalizing things they came to believe for non-smart reasons. Okay. So don't, and one of the places where you can see that when you are being not so smart, you haven't changed your mind in a week at all. Okay. You have technology in search of a problem. Okay. You have only 2x improvement and not 10x. You have not missed your customers fortnightly. Okay? You only hang out with techies and VCs. This came out quite, this was actually the number one, I should put it in number one. Okay? You spend most of your time executing and not researching, observing, analyzing, gathering insights. Okay? So if you're doing any of these, the bottleneck to product market fit is actually you. Okay? So how do you overcome this? Okay? One. The first rule, don't focus on acquisition, don't focus on technology, focus on retention, referral, and LTV of your customers. That's the only thing you have to focus on, okay? Have great people around you who you can trust, who can shout back at you, who can argue back at you. That is very, very important, okay? If you don't have that in your early team, your likelihood of finding a product market fit is close to zero. You are the engine, you are not allowed to have downtime, okay? So therefore, you need to find your uh, venting agents outside of your organization, trusted friends, colleagues, uh, other people whom can listen to you. Inside your organization, you have to be uh, the bubble. So if you are operating at 100x, your team will be operating at 50x. So you decide how ad much adaptive and how fast does your team move. Chance matters. Okay, so you have to maximize your chances by being at the right place at the right time. Okay? If we would have launched Gojek in Vietnam, we would have probably been still as successful, but not as successful as Indonesia, whose economy was at the cusp of increasing significantly from not being a top 20 GDP economy to being one of the top five. Okay? If you are in that kind of a market, you are already maximizing your chances of growth. Okay. Similarly, if people say don't come to Bangalore because a lot of traffic, but being in Bangalore has a lot of uh, other tangible benefits as well. Finally, know your quest. Okay. So know what is it that we are missing. Are we missing retention? Are we missing aha moments? Are we missing referrals? Are we missing lifetime value? And go after that specifically.